It is 11 o'clock Central Time, 12 o'clock Eastern Time, 1800 hours here in Central Europe. So wherever you are calling in from, welcome to everybody. It's always fun to say hi. <laughs> okay, well, if you are a part of Zenzino, then you know how excited we are about our health protocol. I can tell you it's something that has changed uh, my life and my family's life, but you know, what is it really about and how is it really working? What is it really doing? I think absolutely everybody wants to have, you know, their top performance and being, uh, you know, their, their best in their body, their mind, everything about it, right? Well, why is it that the health protocol is really making difference for absolutely everybody. So this call today or our team Zoom is about the hows and the whys of the health protocol. But what's really exciting about today is that we have the scientist who really is the reason we are all here in regards to the health protocol because he's the one who's been formulating these products. Now, I think he's gonna tell you a little bit more about his story and why the health protocol is working for us all. And I know there's a lot of us that are excited about that, right? Yay. <laughs> okay, before we get started here, um, I am going to uh, mute everybody. And, but I also want people, if you have questions, you can make a comment here in the live stream if you're watching live stream, if you're directly here on Zoom, you can put it right into the comments. Or if you're watching on a replay, still make comments because we are uh, going to be answering questions as we go. Or maybe we'll find some questions that we could ask our speaker here. So without further ado, let's bring him on here. He has been working his entire life uh, really focused on making a difference in public health. And we are so proud to have him here. I think I'll have him introduce himself a little bit more. Dr. Paul Clayton. Hello, Dr. Paul. Make sure you're unmuted, Dr. Paul. Okay. Hey, there Carla. Hello to you and to everybody else who's joining in from all the different places. Um, there's not much to say about me. I, the most important thing I think is the, is the science and I'll just try and present that. Okay, well, I think that's really kind of what's important because one of the things you have always said, Dr. Paul, is the science is the science. So it doesn't matter what background people have in regards to if they're interested in health. If you look at the science and the numbers and the facts, you're going to end up here with exactly what you're talking about today, correct? If you have no axe to grind, if you have um if you're honest with yourself if you are concerned about people's health there's really no other place you can end up there are so many lines of evidence that really converge at this point and i'll maybe just list some of the most important ones um one of them is a recent statement that is made by the u.s institute for health metrics and evaluation and this is one of those slightly amorphous bodies that people don't know very much about, but they're, they're important. They uh, are looking at very large numbers and they try to tease out from the mountains of data that they have, what is it that's making us ill? And they publish a statement about once every year or so. And when you look through the small print, you'll find almost every year, what they say is the same thing. But the most important reason for early death, which basically means preventable death in most cases, is disnutrition. And that tells you that there's something really seriously wrong with the diet that we're eating today. The diet that is made available to us in stores, uh, in restaurants, is so unhealthy that according to Imhe, that this is now the most important cause of, life, of 
early death. It's, it's worse than tobacco. The, the food space, which is largely controlled by, you know, really just 10 multinational companies, you've got lots of small ones too, um, is actually, it's killing more of us tobacco, it's killing more of us than alcohol, it's killing more people than um, illegal drugs. It's astonishing. And it's astonishing that more people aren't aware of this. But this really alarming headline news is kept out of the mainstream media. The reason is that the mainstream media, if you look at uh, the ownership structures, they're owned by the same people who own the food companies and the drug companies. There is a, a, a huge concentration of ownership in the hands of very small numbers of institutions and people. And the stakeholders in this really unhealthy arrangement that our environment that we are allowed to live in aren't particularly interested in improving our health at all. That we can, that's one piece of evidence. Another piece of evidence comes from the work of Barry Popkin, who you may, you, I'm sure you've heard me talk about before, and I talk about him because he is important. He's the scientist who coined the term nutrition transition. And he documented in many, many countries a very similar change to public health when a nation leaves its traditional diet behind and moves on to the modern ultra processed diet, public health takes a nose dive. So he calls that nutrition transition and it matches very closely what impact the, the US Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, what they're saying. What Barry says, it's exactly the same thing. He's coming at it from a different angle, but what he says is in every country that leaves the traditional diet behind, we see a tenfold increase in heart disease and cancer and neurodegenerative disease and autoimmune disease and allergy and you know the, the list goes on and on and on and his data is saying just like in his data we're being poisoned humans are being poisoned en masse by this ultra processed diet that so many of us are eating today now not everybody is eating this diet and I'm sure you've heard of blue zones, and they're typically little islands in space where people live a very simple, not modern at all, pre-transitional lifestyle. And some of those are well-known, some are not. The ones that people know about are Okinawa in Japan, although that's changing now. Um, the Loma Linda community in California, that's not so well-known. The Mount Athos Monastery in Greece, uh, Campo de Melli in Italy, there's a few more. Like parts of Sardinia are the same. Um, but then I need to bring in another scientist here called Michael Gervin at the University of California. And he has found another couple of blue zones in other parts of the world that we didn't know so much about before. And he looked at the hunter-gatherer culture, the Hadza in Africa, and the forager horticulturalist community in Bolivia called the Tsimang. And when you add his blue zone data to the other blue zones I've been talking about, you see that in these people who are eating a pre-transitional diet, they don't get sick in the way that we do at all. They tend to stay very, very healthy until right before the end of their lives, and then they die very quickly. Their life expectancy is the same, but their health expectancy is much, much better. And ideas like this, data like this, has given rise to the idea that what it makes us so many of us sick now, what indeed um, creates the pattern of aging that most people are familiar with are these diseases of civilization. We were becoming more civilized, so we're getting different diseases because we've conquered the infections and we're living longer, we're getting these infectious diseases, these, these degenerative diseases. Well, that's just a myth. Nothing could be less true. We're not living longer. Life expectancy has not actually increased since the mid 19th century. The reason why it looks as if it is, is because infant mortality is less, and so the average is better. It looks as if we're all living longer, we're not. Actually, life expectancy is falling at the moment. And um, all this creates an environment where we now think it's normal to start dementing or getting cancer or getting heart disease as we get older. But all those blue zones, all those pre-transitional cultures show us no, you don't need to get sicker as you get older. That's not normal. It's not normal for humans to do that at all. 
So let me put that on one side for a moment. And now let's come back to where you and the rest of the audience are. We're all living in let's, what we could call laughably civilized countries. I don't think we're any more civilized than we were a century ago. And so we have this terrible diet, really bad lifestyle, and huge amounts of cancer and heart disease and Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's and the list goes on and on and on. And you think, well, okay, I'm just 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, and I don't have those diseases yet, so it doesn't affect me. Wrong. Those diseases are very, very slowly developing. They have long latent phases. So you're developing those diseases much, much earlier in life. Say the symptoms of a disease appear when you reach your 70th birthday. You probably had that disease since you were 40, but it's been developing very, very slowly, burning underground until so much damage has been done that it becomes obvious you start having symptoms at the age of 70. And this is what we find when we analyze groups of people who are young to middle-aged and who think they're healthy. When we look at them in detail, we can see they're not. They already have in their bodies the early evidence of developing coronary artery disease or cancer or osteoporosis or dementia. It's happening. And this has really modified our picture of what living in the 21st century is actually doing to us. Yes, it's creating an enormous burden of chronic degenerative disease, which is a huge economic and financial and personal burden to the state and to families and to us as individuals. But in that period of our lives, which we think of as at the prime of our lives, actually we're not healthy during that period either. We have these diseases in early stage, preclinical stage, and they are reducing our functionality. They're making our lives, they're they're making it impossible for us to um, develop our true biological potential. And so our intelligence is not as good as it should be. Our attention span is not as good as it should be. Our impulse control is not as good as it should be. Our physical strength and endurance is not where it should be. We're losing all of those things little by little, imperceptibly, and because it's happening so slowly, and because it's happening to all of us, and because we think it's normal to age in that way, it's invisible. People don't realize that it's there. But as I said, if you take the time and the trouble to go to those blue cultures and see how people live and see people in their 70s, 80s, 90s running around like young things, still fully functional and absolutely healthy, then you come back to Minneapolis or Stockholm or Rome or London and you realize we're not like that. We're not like that at all. We are really, really sick. And nowhere is that more obvious in North America because North Americans eat more ultra processed foods than anywhere else. Around about 60% of all the calorie intake is coming from ultra processed foods in North America. And Britain comes next and then a few other countries, Australia and uh, Finland and Ireland. And when I look around and I'm at the moment, I'm um, in the East coast of the United States. When I look around, what I see are people who are, whose aging has been incredibly accelerated. When I go back to Scotland and I've met some of the people that I was at school with, well, a large number of them are dead. Almost all of the rest of them are ill. They're taking multiple pharmaceuticals and they don't even look like the same generation as I do. I can still function physically pretty much as I did when I left university. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm 71, as you know, and I, I don't take painkillers. I, I don't really take medication of any sort at all, other than uh, full disclosure, I take a small dose of flaconide because I have a slight tendency to develop atrial fibrillation, but that's all. Now, when I go and see a doctor here for whatever reason, or when I'm in a social situation where I'm talking to medical personnel, what they tell me and what I know from other published papers is that for most people of my age in North America, they're taking, they, they have between two and four chronic degenerative diseases, and they're taking between six and 10 different medications, chronic medications. They've accelerated their aging process, and I haven't. Now, there's nothing special about me. It's just that I took a decision a long time ago to adopt a pre-transitional diet. 
And that's hard to do. You have to learn how to cook. You have to learn how to work with basic foodstuffs and not eat ultra processed foods. And I'd recommend that to everybody. But because I realized quite a long time ago that this involved a good deal of work and time, which not everybody is willing to do that or has time to do these things, I wanted to develop a series of hacks or pharmaconutritional tools that would reproduce pre transitional nutrition. And that was the rationale for developing the health protocol. That's what it does. It recreates the nutritional profile of a blue zone, of a pre-transitional diet. Even if you're eating modern foods, the health protocol will take you back. And in that sense, what we've done in the people all around the world now who are using the health protocol, they actually constitute a kind of man-made blue zone. We've made a blue zone all of our own. And um, I think you and many other people here have seen the impact on their health. One of the reasons why doctors are rushing to join us in so many different countries now, in over 60 countries, is they see what the impact on their patients is. Patients they've been managing for years or decades, managing into oblivion, basically, because the pharmaceuticals we use are entirely non-curative. Then they start seeing their patients going into remission, becoming pharmaceutically independent. And then those doctors who are intellectually curious and who really have their patients' interests at heart, and there are many doctors like that, then they start to get interested and then they contact us and then they start to get involved. This is the beginning of, I think, a really important change in medical thinking. I'm not saying we abandon pharmaceuticals wholesale. We're always going to need those. And for any doctors who are sitting in on this call, when patients come to us, with pain or disability and their suffering, we have a duty of care to them and we use pharmaceuticals to manage those problems. But in all honesty, we also know that anything that we have access to from the pharmaceutical industry is really palliative and not much more than that. It can reduce the intensity of symptoms. It is not curative with the exception of the antibiotics. And I think what this new understanding is that's emerging is that we can use the pharmaceuticals to manage the symptomatic aspects of our patients' problems. We can use the health protocol to redress the fundamentals, um, the nutritional and physiological fundamentals of health, <clears throat> and get our patients to a point where they no longer need as many pharmaceuticals and in many cases eventually become drug-free and I hesitate to use this word because doctors are taught not to use this word, actually to cure them, to cure, for example, their essential hypertension, their osteopenia, their <clears throat> age-related cognitive decline. It's a huge claim to make that uh, many doctors have seen this for themselves and many of you have seen this for yourselves as well. So Dr. Paul, we've seen so much. It's so exciting to hear that we in Zenzino have actually created like our own blue zone. That just is, you know, kind of an incredible thing. But, you know, we know that, you know, there's been uh, so much, uh, you know, problems in people's health. And we see that, you know, even though it's like, you know, we know more and more about health, it's just that the world keeps getting sicker. And I do think people are going to start going, wait a minute, what's going on here? And how can we fix that, right? And but we're excited about Zenzino and we're excited about the health protocol because as you said, it's really helping so many people. We've heard story after story after story, but can you tell us why? We have our health protocol of, of our three products, but what is it that they're doing and how is it, and how is it helping everybody in, in short? Right, well, if you look at how the modern lifestyle is creating all these diseases of civilization, um, you end up with the health protocol. I mean, to simply talk about diseases of civilization is not at all helpful. It's a resonant concept. It's, uh, it's almost poetic, but it's very fuzzy. It's not detailed enough to allow you to propose antidotes. And so for, for a long, long time, what I've been involved in, my own research is focused on trying to identify the ways in which the modern diet is making so many people so ill. And um, I've been lucky enough to uh, talk to scientists and clinical scientists and researchers the world over uh, about their work. And I've been in a position where I can stand up, look over the edge of my cubicle or silo and see what other people are doing and talk to them and import ideas, exchange ideas. 
And we've gotten to the point now where we can break down this idea of diseases of civilization into four major disease mechanisms. And um, are you hearing a beetle track? What's that, Dr. I Paul? We, yeah, I, th I thought I heard some music coming in there for a moment. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, so yes, we've got to the point where we're, we understand what it is about the modern diet and lifestyle that makes us sick. And there are four mechanisms. One of them is one that everybody knows a little bit about, and that's chronic inflammatory stress, chronic inflammation. And what chronic inflammation does, it leads to the progressive destruction of healthy functional tissue. Uh, we know how to stop that. And we can stop that with this combination of omega-3s and amphiphilic polyphenols, which is basically fish oil and olive oil, the Inuit diet and the Mediterranean diet put together into a bottle, if you like. And that is really, really good at stopping chronic inflammation. And the clinical trial that we're doing now, the interim results are just phenomenal. They're unlike anything anybody else has ever seen. Um, but that's only one of the horsemen, one of the other horsemen of this nutritional apocalypse. As I said, there's four, that one of the other one is type B malnutrition. Um, if I go back to the hunter-gatherers or forager hubs or culturalists, those are very active people. They're running at say three to six to even 7,000 calories a day. And that's probably what we co-evolved with. That was our a lifestyle that was actually a good one for us. But if you're um, a metropolitan, or an urbanite and you have a white collar occupation, you're more likely to be living at about 2000 calories a day, kilocalories a day. And out of those kilocalories, if you're eating a lot of ultra processed foods, a lot of them are empty because you're eating a lot of plant oil and sugar. And that ends up in a situation where we find when we break down your diet, what you're actually putting into you is you have type B malnutrition. You're low on many of the vitamins, many of the trace elements, um, some of the really important dietary fibers, the omega threes that goes without saying, but also a lot of phytonutrients, including carotenoids and xanthophylls and polyphenols, and then various conditionally essential amino sugars and amino acids and methyl group donors. And the list is on and on and on and on. You're low in everything. And what that does, it hampers your body's ability to heal and repair and regenerate. So on the one hand, you've got chronic inflammation, which is tearing down your tissues. On the other hand, you've got type B malnutrition, which is hampering your ability to heal. And so over time, there's a progressive loss of healthy tissue. And if that's in your cartilage, we say you have osteoarthritis. If it's in your bone, you have osteoporosis. If it's in the lining of your arteries, you have coronary artery disease. If it's inside your skull, you're starting to lose so many brain cells that your nearest and dearest are starting to notice. And this is one of the hallmarks of chronic degenerative disease. It's slow, progressive destruction of healthy tissue. So those two horsemen, chronic inflammation and type B malnutrition are really, really important. But there's two more that are just as important. And one of those is dysbiosis, which means that um, you have the wrong, really the wrong population of microbes in the, the large bowel, which creates all kinds of problems. It creates inflammatory stress, it creates leaky bowel, it means you have inflammatory or uh, irritable bowel disease or, or inflammatory bowel disease, but you also have endotoxemia, which leads to liver disease and more heart disease. And you have all kinds of macromolecules getting from the gut into the bloodstream, which leads down the road towards allergy and autoimmune disease and probably um, neurodegenerative disease as well. So that's the third thing. And the fourth thing is we have something called glycemic mismatch. We have a diet which is presenting us with enormous amounts of sugars and uh, fast digesting carbohydrates. So you're pouring glucose into the bloodstream. We're not physically very active, so we don't abstract enough of that. I know people think that the liver is the important glucose sink. It isn't, that has a very limited capacity. In most cultures and at most times, skeletal muscle was the important glucose sink. And that's now being taken offline because we're so sedentary. So glucose starts piling up in the bloodstream, creating um, glycation end products, which are very pro-inflammatory. You start building up hypoglycemia, hyperinsulinemia. You, your, your blood lipid chemistry starts to go wrong also because your liver is dysfunctional. And you move towards metabolic syndrome and then type 2 diabetes and bang, you've lost six to eight years of life expectancy. 
So these really are the four horsemen of the nutritional apocalypse. And to stop the first horse, which is chronic inflammation, we can put him back in the stable, or her, if you want, with balance oil. With the type B malnutrition, we can stop that horse in its tracks with Extend, which is designed to raise your nutrient profile, micro and phytonutrients, to the level that we see in a blue zone. The dysbiotic horse, we can brush uh, off uh, out of the picture with um, Xenobiotic, which is this time release blend of prebiotic fibers. And the fourth horse, at the moment, that's up to you because you've got to stop eating so much sugar and there's sugar in all the ultra processed foods. Take a little more exercise and everybody says that. And for those who can't, we do have a hack for that as well, um, which we could release now, but we are multinational. And the regulators in Denmark who are very odd, they're out of step with everybody else. They're obviously very small minded, neurotic and um, I won't go into that, let's not get personal, but they say, oh, this Chinese herb, which has been used in China for hundreds of years, if not millennia, and is accepted as safe everywhere else, the Danes are so fragile that they must be protected from the benefits of this particular herb. This is a herb that reproduces the effects and benefits of physical exercise, and it would be enough to stop the fourth horse woman in his tracks. At some point, the Danes, I think, even the Danes will see sense and once that happens, we will introduce this fourth antidote to the health protocol. But as many of you have found, even with the first three, the benefits in health and health expectancy are phenomenal. We sure do see that, Dr. Paul. There's so many stories out there. So, you know, there are people who are still skeptics. We have people who are talking to some of the health professionals uh, about that. and and some people are saying, ah, I don't know if this is completely true, but you've told us that, you know, the science is the science. So if they really look at things, they should find that, correct? Or what would you say in regards to the skeptics? Um, I look, I, I would say that for a doctor or for a clinical scientist or a scientist of any sort, skepticism should be your default mode. Skepticism is absolutely correct. One should be skeptical. Um, and I would say to them, that um, come and have a look at our science, look at our books, look at the books that I've written on this, which are uh, mostly pretty heavily referenced. Look at my blog, which is also very heavily referenced. Look at the results that we see in our users of the health protocol. I think that for many doctors and clinical scientists, um, this, one of the reasons for their skepticism is because they're very skeptical of the whole supplement industry. And so they should be. I, I have no time for the supplement business. I think it's a, a terrible business. They're selling junk mostly. When you look at a lot of the products that are available, and there's thousands of them, the vast majority are so badly formulated, they couldn't do anything at all. They could not possibly work. Um, the doctors also have two more reservations. And one of those is the fact that they don't really know how to look at this field um, they don't have the intellectual background because they don't study nutrition at medical school. They come out of medical school really knowing a good deal about pharmaceutical medicine, but very little about natural pharmacology, in fact, almost nothing. And the third reason why there is this bedrock of skepticism, which I fully understand, is that when supplements are tested, the ones on the market are so bad that they generally show up with absolutely null results. So one of the two largest sectors in the supplement market, the largest is fish oil, which is a $2 billion a year plus industries, huge. People swallow huge amounts of fish oil. Does it work? No, it doesn't. And this is where the Cochrane collaboration comes in. There are a group of uh, you know, the good and the great and the wise clinicians and clinical scientists to test the impact of commercial fish oil in different populations with different types of health conditions. And lots of these trials have been done, probably just anywhere between 75 and 100 of them by now, but lots of studies, probably more. And when you look at all of them and take all the results and do a meta-analysis, and many of these have been done, the conclusion that inevitably comes out is, well, fish oil doesn't really do anything very much. And yet it's this $2 billion a year plus industry. So doctors see that, they know their patients are taking them, they know that the fish oil doesn't do anything when it's tested, and they think, well, God, this supplement business, this just crooks. And there are a lot of crooks. 
And then the other, the second biggest sector in the supplement business are the multivitamins and, vitamin, and uh, multiminerals. And they've been tested too. And they don't do anything either. They're not addressing the main issues. Basically, fish oil is so poorly formulated, commercial fish oil, that it doesn't work and it doesn't get into the, uh, the, 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 the tissue, <laughs> the cell membranes where it's needed. We know that. We see that in, uh, in, our, in our library of balance tests. And, um, you know, it, it couldn't possibly work, which is why we don't sell fish oil. We sell something that's more like a liquid fish. Um, eating fish is healthy. There's lots of studies that show that it is, and fish oil isn't. Why is that? Because there's more in an oily fish than there is in fish oil. So what, all we did was to take the missing ingredient that we know is in those oily fish and put it back into the fish oil. We get it from olives. It's the same thing as you find in oily fish. So we have the benefits um, there, which distinguish it from fish oil. And I'll just tell you this. We, this, this first of a series of randomized clinical trials that we're doing, first is being done um, in a major academic center in, in Europe. We're looking at a condition known as essential hypertension, very common, cannot be cured by any pharmaceutical product. It can be managed, but it cannot be cured. And it is thought to be a part of the aging process. It can't be cured because that's how you age. <laughs> In the vestigial cultures, blood pressure does not increase as you get older. It's a result of being chronically poisoned. Chronic inflammatory stress is a part of this. In our study, half of our subjects are taking fish oil and half are taking balance oil. The fish oil group is the placebo group. They will have no effect whatsoever. We know that the Cochrane collaboration has already told us. Nothing is happening to them at all. In the group that are taking balance oil, most of them are becoming drug free. And that's one reason why the medics are so excited. And I designed the trial specifically in this way to deliver a broadside against the medical profession. I've said, here's the way to cure essential hypertension. And I'm saying to the fish oil industry, for God's sake, clean up your act, stop selling this rubbish and reformulate your product. I'm not against other companies who sell fish oil. I want to improve public health. And if we can prove, and we are doing this, that balance oil is doing something that fish oil can't, that will be a spur to the big fish oil companies to force them to reformulate their product in a way that will actually do some good. So I'm, I love Zinzino, I want to support them, but my end goal is improving public health. And um, you can see I'm, 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 I'm playing this game in, in, a, in a few different ways here. Oh, we love that though, Dr. Paul, because we know you're just gonna tell the truth. You're not in this as part of the, you know, the, the people out to sell this, you are out to make sure people are having the best and optimal health ever. So we love our health protocol and we can see a lot of the hows, we can also see the whys, but is there anybody who should not be taking this? There was a question in the chat of uh, someone uh, who was told that maybe due to thyroid issues of not taking so much iodine. So are there other issues or is there anybody who should not be taking the health protocol? Well, yes, there are. I mean, and let me respond to that question about iodine. If you have um, hot spots on the thyroid, uh, you probably shouldn't be taking uh, iodine. The amount of iodine that is present in extent is actually very small. It's a quarter of the RNA. And you can probably get away with that. Uh, actually, iodine depletion or hypoiodinization is actually more common now. It's a bit like vitamin D. Lots and lots of people are de depleted in iodine for a whole range of reasons, which we probably don't have time to go into. But are there other contraindications? Um, yes, I think there are. Um, if you're taking blood thinners, then I think it's not a contraindication, but it's a sign that you should be cautious. And the reason for that is that um, as you use things like balance oil to bring your six to three ratio down, once you get down to 2.5 to 1.5 to one, your bleeding time will start to extend. And if you're already taking uh, antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulants, this could create the risk of a bleed. And so in practical terms, what I will very often say to people, look, if you start taking balance oil and at some point, you start to notice spontaneous bruising, typically on the arms or the legs, sometimes on the body as well. At that point, start to cut down on, on if you're taking, let's say, aspirin and Plavix and, and warfarin and God knows what else, 
remove one of those, cut your aspirin or cut the plavix and tell your doctor that you've been changing your diet, you're eating more salmon. I mean, eating balanced oil is the same as eating salmon. Doctors are afraid of balanced oil because it's a supplement. They're not afraid of people eating salmon. And the doctor will think, oh, well, they're probably doing something good and something healthy, but I can see that might affect the bleeding time. So I will take it upon myself to adjust the dosage of the drugs I'm giving them. And that's going to be a good and healthy and positive outcome. Um, so we also there's another to, issue with we, we do want to say care. that we are, are connecting with the doctors too so people should follow um you know or check with the doctor at, on most of everything that they're taking you know so that we know yeah. that they are working with their absolutely doctor. absolutely we, we we don't want to go behind the doctor's backs i mean the doctor has a duty of care to his or her patient and we don't want to suddenly introduce a variable into this mixture that's going to uh, adversely affect the patient or the doctor's ability to care for the patient. And so uh, I always say to, to anyone who asks, okay, if you're going to do like something like this, I think it's going to have that effect, let your doctor know. Um, but then what I'll typically say is, well, what you should tell your doctor is this, if you're going to take balance oil, don't tell him or her that you're taking a supplement because doctors are trained to panic when they hear the word supplements. Simply say, I'm going to change my diet and I'm going to eat more salmon or herring or mackerel. Doctors aren't scared of that, which is odd because it's exact equivalent of eating balance oil. Um, but the doctor will then know to expect, well, there may be some changes here and I should, uh, I should do my best to accommodate them. Another area where I think it's important to talk to doctors is in that subgroup of patients who are taking anti-K, anticoagulants, such as warfarin and coumarin, that group of drugs. This is actually a very uh, dangerous group of, of drugs, and it's responsible for a disproportionate number of adverse drug effects. Uh, because if you're taking an anti-K, anticoagulant, and you have a diet where maybe once every now and then you might eat a bowl full of spinach salad, you're taking a high dose of K1. So your K1 spikes and the impact on the effect of the anticoagulant can be quite, quite marked. That's not necessarily going to be good for you. So what we have done is to adopt a more responsible approach and combine the K1 with K2. And there's other reasons for adding K2 anyway. And K2 has got very different pharmacokinetic attributes. Instead of K1, which spikes in the blood and goes away again, K2 gets into the blood and stays there and you establish a steady state baseline level of K. What the Japanese have shown is that once you've done that, the anti-K anticoagulants become safer because your baseline isn't going up and down, it's steady. And then the otherwise uh, potentially dangerous fluctuations in clotting time that you see in many patients on anti -co anticoagulants, they become smoothed out and the degree of risk of a clot or a bleed becomes less. But most doctors don't know that, they don't read the science. And so very often they come to me so they're extremely nervous and I say, look, look at the science and I send them a bunch of papers. And then once they've seen that and they understand the science, they then relax and they then get very happy about their patients, taking extend and establishing a K2 baseline. So that was that's an apparent contraindication which actually turns out to be an advantage. Um, there's other um, possible areas where one would say, okay, go cautiously here. Uh, if you have um, IBS or IBD, I would say with something like xenobiotic, it's a very good idea to correct your dysbiosis, but don't try and do it all at once. Don't start with a maximal dose because whatever's going on in the lower bowel, you have the wrong population of microbes, but it is a sort of a steady state. It's an unhealthy one, it's damaging you. But when we start intervening, there's going to be a period of transition which might not be very comfortable for you. So let's just take it easy. Build the population of probiotic species in easy stages using graded and increasing doses of xenobiotic over a period of 10 days to two weeks. That makes the transition easier and it'll make compliance better. So there, there's little things like this where we should, rather than just say, oh, just take this and everything will be fine. Let's go into switch say instead, okay, if you have these types of symptoms, this type of diagnosis, it's a little bit different. We'll go a little bit more carefully. That's all. I love that, Dr. Paul. Okay, so there's some people that also say, you know, when they're 
taking the balance oil or, you know, they can feel something in their throat. Uh, it's not maybe all the time, but some have it and, and it's some don't. So what is it that they're feeling when they're taking the balance oil? They're feeling the polyphenols. They're feeling the polyphenols and the polyphenols have a slight astringency to them. Um, you'll notice this if you were ever to drink olive oil. Uh, I know that you wouldn't normally go around drinking glasses of olive oil, but if you've ever been to an olive oil tasting, you will know that some olive oils are very smooth and relatively bland, mild. Others can be quite peppery. And that sense of pepperiness, that, uh, those other phenolic molecules, they, ha they, they, they have that characteristic. Um, mm -hmm. And to give you a kind of ethnobotanical example of that perhaps some of the people in the audience may have heard of a berry called the choke berry otherwise known as aronia and the choke berry is called a uh, choke because when you eat it or drink the, the juice <laughs> it'll add concentrations of these same polyphenols and it's the lower levels of polyphenols and balance what the people are feeling in the throat in the back of the throat when they swallow it Okay, so we know that when we're coughing or when we're feeling that, that we know it's working. In essence. In a way, yes. That's okay. a good thing. Okay, yes. so I, I'm going to just take one. Uh, well, actually, there's maybe two topics I'm going to bring up. And the first one is about blood sugars. You know, is this something that affects blood sugars? Uh, some people have issues with, uh, with blood sugars. Um, well, balance, getting back into balance will, will have a positive impact on, uh, on your ability to handle glucose and sugars in general, because uh, once the 6 to 3 ratio falls to, let's say, 2.5 or 2, you actually become more insulin sensitive. Um, this is not a cure for diabetes. It's not intended to do that, and it, it won't do that. But it is an improvement. Uh, so if you have mild metabolic syndrome, by getting into balance, you're probably going to see some improvement there. Uh, it's to do with a restructuring of the cell membranes, which seems to improve the ability of the insulin receptor, which is embedded in the cell membrane, for any insulin that's floating around. I would also say to anyone who has metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes, really there's other steps you need to take, and they involve reducing your intake of carbohydrates um, and simple, you know, simple carbohydrates and sugars, taking more physical exercise, and also consider things like intermittent fasting. Um, something as simple as not eating in the two hours before bed has already been shown to be protective. And if you can extend the period of fasting to let's say 16 hours, 18 hours, take your last meal at six in the evening and not eat again until 10 in the morning, doing something as simple as that has been shown to confer a whole array of metabolic benefits, including improved insulin sensitivity. Oh, we love that, fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna have the last if, if, question. If you want to, if you, it, if you want to drill into this, okay, but if, you, if anyone wants to drill into this in more detail, some of this is referred to in my books, which are available at surprisingly reasonable prices. I think they're sort of nine or 10 euros each or maybe less. Um, or you can just go to the blog, which doesn't cost anything, and just type in whatever search term you're interested. In. It'll throw up a couple of posts which talk about these topics in much more detail. And each blog is very heavily referenced, you know, between 50 and sometimes 80 references which will allow you to go back to the original research and then dive into the literature for anyone who's enough of a, an obsessive or a geek to want to do that. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Paul's blog is drpaulclayton.eu. So keep note of that. So I have my last question here, Dr. Paul, and maybe because, you know, it's not only been incredible for myself, I feel better than I ever have before, but, I want to make sure that my grandchildren, I have two of them, and I want to make sure that they are also having the best life possible for them too. Brain function, you know, their body, their development. Is the health protocol good for kids? 
Well, let me just say that you're a very glamorous granny. You look far too young to be a granny. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a grandfather, uh, and I'm also concerned about the health of my grandchildren. I think that a lot of the value of the health protocol is in protecting against chronic degenerative disease. And young children aren't necessarily in that kind of holding pattern. They're starting off with reasonable health, one hopes anyway. And I don't like supplementing people who don't need to be supplemented. And if those kids are active and running around and eating a good diet, varied diet, I don't think they need our help. Um, however, against that, what we are seeing at the sharp end are huge increases in the numbers of children who have got a neurodevelopmental disorder, who have allergy, um, and who have uh, mental health problems. The, all these areas are really spiraling at the moment. And it's pretty obvious that all of us, all of us are linked to nutritional issues. So in children with specific health problems, yes, balanced soil can be helpful. For children with neurodevelopmental disorders, I would certainly also add xenobiotic to re, um, restore a pre-transitional microbiota. And I would consider using Viva as well, which has very interesting and very specific properties all of its own. Um, for children with allergy, I think uh, the Protect, which is 1,3,1,6 beta-glucans can be very helpful uh, because that changes your Th1, Th2 balance. It, sort of increases TH2 numbers, and that is a profoundly anti-allergy uh, mechanism. And if that's enough, great. If it isn't, I would add balance oil because that adds an anti-inflammatory component. And we're seeing many, many children uh, who had initially presented with allergy symptoms of one sort of another, whether it's asthma or uh, rhinitis or dermatitis or whatever, um, go into remission. And if we can help children to uh, achieve a, a healthier start in life, to develop more of that potential. I think that's really important. And I think anyone who's a parent or a grandparent, I think must think the same way. Yes, absolutely, Dr. Paul. So I uh, absolutely have loved every minute of um, this live Zoom call. Uh, just starting out talking about this blue zone and creating them. And I know in your heart, that's one of the things that you've always been striving to accomplish is to make that improvement. Um, just at the end here to say, what do you expect to be creating with uh, Zinzino here? Because I know one thing that you have told me and have said that the founders of the company, the other scientists involved on the scientific advisory board in Zencino and our CEO, you have quite a united vision on what you really want to do for public health. What do you see in the future for this? Um, you know, I think, I think that's true. We, we're like-minded in, in many ways. And it's just, a, it's a coincidence that we found each other and we're able to create um, a little environmental niche where we could where we could collaborate. One thing that every single other person um, at that level in Zinzino shares, and I'm talking about the um, Orian and Doug and the other members of the scientific advisory board, they all have this rather neurotic compulsion which I share, of wanting to leave the world better than it was when we found it. You might think that was incredibly arrogant or foolish or just grandiose, but my own background is uh, um, a rather Calvinistic one. I was born and raised in Scotland, went through a Scottish Presbyterian school and a university. And I, I do feel a huge sense of um, duty or responsibility to try and make things better for people. Perhaps being the oldest of four children was another factor that fed into that. And I, I noticed the same thing in Diamond Orient. And um, I think, as I said, in, in the rest of the scientific advisory board, we really want to make a difference and help people to live better lives. I think that for many of the people in the Zinzino network, I think that they get it and they also want to help. And there's plenty of people in the team and we live in a mixed economy who want to use Zinzino to build a business and become financially independent. And that's great. You know, there's all kinds of ways in which you can make money. And if you can make money by doing good or to do it. So we have this disparate army 
rapidly growing army of people in this uh, Zinzino ecosphere. And we are starting to see differences. We are starting, I think, to improve public health to the point where even at the national level, we're starting to see slight changes. And we're just at the beginning of that. We're still at very, very early days, but I'm hoping for great things. I, I do want to do something to reduce this vast and unnecessary amount of suffering and premature ill health and not and non-communicable degenerative disease that the multinational food industries have condemned us to. Um, I, I, I think we can do better than that. And one thing I can tell you is this, I'm now hearing from people in the food industry and the companies that supply the food industry that make me think we're onto something because they come to me in ones and twos and sometimes in small research groups and say, well, we understand that the foods that we're making may be commercially very successful, but we understand that they are contributing to an enormous burden of public ill health. What can we do about it? And I'm in discussions with some of them and, um, and what I'm saying to them, look, you do realize there are ways in which we could make today's ultra processed foods much, much better for you. Now, ultra processed foods, which is what everybody's eating, people like them because they're convenient, they're cheap and they taste good. Um, and everybody thinks ultra processed foods are really terrible. And there's lots of evidence that says today's ultra processed foods are really unhealthy. They cause more cancer, diabetes, heart disease, neurodegenerative disease. The evidence is all there. But ultra processed foods don't have to be bad for your health. And with a little bit of tinkering, and this is really an area that I'm very, very involved in and very interested in at the moment, the next generation of ultra processed foods could be made really positively functional. And when that happens, there will be no more need for supplementation. And that's where I want to get to. It's going to take at least 10 years. These are large, large companies. They take ages to turn around and develop new business models. It's a very slow process. But for the next decade, at least, since you know it's going to be absolutely essential and it's going to command this area. There's no one else that's doing anything quite like this. As I said, the more and more people are looking over our shoulder now and thinking, well, there is something here and we should find a way of going in the same direction. So I do hope for progress. I, I hope for it devoutly. That's why, that's why I went to medical school in the first place. Love that, Dr. Paul. And you can feel the passion about it and that we believe you and that those of us who have been following the health protocol for about 10 years here, we're feeling that benefit and we're seeing the benefit and we want to help so many people do the same thing. So we thank you, Dr. Paul, and thank you for coming on and taking the time here. Uh, I am so appreciative that you do that and let us all uh, hear about what we're doing and what Zenzino is going to be accomplishing. And we're following you, Dr. Paul. So thanks everybody for joining us and thank you, Dr. Paul, for your time. Can I say one more thing? If, okay. if, if, I, if, if, if you can be, just be patient with me sure, for a moment sure. more. For, for any doctors, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Paul. Just a sec. Uh, no, just a thank sec. you. I, I just hang on, Dr. Paul. I was just going to mute everybody again. We have uh, hundreds of people on here. So let me just unmute you one last time before I had just unmuted everybody. Your last comments here, Dr. Paul. Make sure you're unmuted. Well, I just wanted to say that um, I know that increasingly with these discussions that there are doctors and clinical scientists who are getting involved in these calls and who are listening and um, who are either skeptical or perhaps a little less skeptical or open-minded. Um, look, I, I welcome you, your comments and your criticisms. I don't have all the keys. I really don't. And there are many other good and, and, uh, and a sprinkling of great scientists out there who have access to information that I don't have, that I don't know about, that I don't understand. For anyone who is interested in this project of improving public health, uh, do get in touch. And um, I'm, I'm always willing, I'm always happy to, 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 to listen and, and to maintain a dialogue with, uh, with my peers in, um, in clinical research. Love that. Well, and I think that is just testimony to say you are always working to be better and better and improving. Uh, I think uh, our CEO says it's in Japanese, Kaisan is constant improvement. Yes. And yes. that's exactly what you're saying is you want to also, people don't know what they don't know, including yourself, Dr. Paul. So 
Thank you so much for putting uh, not years to our life, but life to our years. We're so appreciative of all of that. And now I will allow everybody to get unmuted and say thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you for your time, your wisdom, and for what you do here. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Paul. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank, Paul. Thank, thank you, Dr. Paul. 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 Thank you, too. Bye-bye from Mexico thank City. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Bye. Thank you to all thank of you. you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody.